Amazon boxes. Okay. Like, how many Amazon boxes do you throw out every week? I don't because we ship stuff. I, so I have a whole bunch of them right now in my office, actually. Because I tell you, if I could get a penny for every Amazon box that shows up at my front door, I would own Amazon. That's how much stuff. Why do you get so much stuff? I don't. Who does? Your child? My, my, my significant counterpart, the love of my life. Gets a lot of Amazons. So much stuff on Amazon. In fact, it's if amazing. you look online, I love shopping on Amazon. There's a lot of people that fall into this category, and I just need to publicly say it out loud: enough Amazon boxes. Welcome to or welcome back to More In Common. This is our social experiment. See, everyone has a story that can help us learn from one another. And we bring people into this safe space that we have learned to create so we can learn about their stories and get into difficult topics that challenge us in conversation and ultimately how we think. And we have a lot of these conversations and we're seeing a lot of similar threads through all of them. So what we're doing is breaking down these conversations to create a set of tools and a map that will help you become a conversation boss so that you can be a catalyst for conversation in your day-to-day life. Yeah, so let's let's go back to our episode from a couple weeks ago with Pete. Mm-hmm. Um, Rod, what did you take away from it? When we were talking about employees and companies and the relationship between them and people doing things just for more profits and... I can't remember which company he said he worked for and I think it was LA or SoCal and they had three quarters of a million dollars of profit and that wasn't enough and it just got me thinking a lot and then you and I had a conversation about that and just how we look at it and how we are going to treat profit in in our organization or organizations and how we're going to take care of employees and um, so that was that was like the the one of the things I've been thinking about yeah. most recently, yesterday specifically. That was a good one. What about you? Yeah. Um, I think the thing that stuck with me the most is the possibility of cultural discussion. Like the way he talks about it there in Italy and his experience and with all the people that he has, um, that he's around. Like they talk about it. Talk about it at the dinner table. They you know, they fight, they get angry, but then they stay friends, right? Or they stay family. It's it's just different culturally at least in his experience which for me it's like oh it's possible we just need to do it right Mm -hmm. um and you know the power of representation like we've talked a lot about representation from the you're black seeing black people in those in positions right or represented in media like the way he talks about it he's white and he sees you know, black women in power um, and, you know, just a different dynamic of, of the impact of, of representation. And I just, I thought that stream of the conversation just it really stuck out to me. And then his whole analogy of walking and talking, like I can just walk, if I learn to walk and talk, I can do anything. It just, I, I, I just love that piece. But uh, yeah, that's what, that's, that's what, what I got from it now. I like that. I like that one a lot as well. And I feel like it just gave, um, I, I've, I've kind of felt like that. I just didn't have words to explain it, but yeah, it's like, give me enough time. I can figure out anything. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, um, we have Dolly Chug today. Mm-hmm. Um, what did we talk about with Dolly? Um, yeah. First thing I call out is that I messed up my read of Carol Dweck's name and I read it as, you know what? We don't need to go there again. It's Carol Dweck, and I know that now. <laughs> Live reads. This is a learning. Live reads. Read them once before, especially with names. See if you can figure them out, yeah. especially if you're not strong with phonics. It's <laughs> good. Just saying. But we talked about we talked about forks. 
Yeah. <laughs> in the dishwasher. <laughs> yeah. So good. I love it. Uh, we talked about her path and her path from corporate America, well, school and, and corporate America to being a professor and, and bounded ethicality. We talk about bounded ethicality. What the heck is that? And um, much, much, much more. But you're going to have to just listen to get into it because Dolly is a fascinating human being. She's written a wonderful book. We do talk about her book. And uh, Keith and I have both read it, read it. Oh, I'm still, I'm reading it a second time. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had, we do recommend it. But um, yeah, those are things we get into. One thing that struck me from the conversation is Dolly talks about what got her into, or, or got her interested in being a professor. And she talks about what professors really do. And I got to say, I don't think I knew, like I knew some of my professors in college and I went to open our office hours and got some help. But I didn't really... I guess I didn't really understand the scope. I knew a couple of them wrote books. A couple of them wrote the books that we were studying from, but I didn't really think about what that meant. They were doing research and they were writing and they're fellows and just all kinds of stuff. So she got into that and that was interesting for me. Uh, awesome. Keith, what about you on the conversations tip side of the house? So in Dolly's book, The Person You Mean to Be, she talks about how allies um, often seek cookies cookie seeking, right? And if you read the book, it's amazing. We're not going to talk about it too much here. But it's really about, you know, when when someone you see experiences something and you try to express empathy or sympathy by making it about you, right? Oh, let me tell you about how that impacted me rather than just being there for them. And there is a moment in the episode where Rodney and Dolly are talking about something. And I really wanted to edit this out. But I actually, it it might not be so obvious, but it's they're talking about their experience about being outsiders. And I come in and start talking about how, yeah, I felt like an outsider too. Now, emotionally, that may be true, but it was in a way a cookie seeking moment. And Rodney and I actually talked about it afterwards. And I, and I, Mm -hmm. we keep it in there and I log it because it's, it's not fun for me to have it in there, but at the same time, it's so we can rep- recognize when we're doing that type of behavior because of the impact it may have on the person with whom we're talking to. It makes the, the episodes fine with it, but it, you know, just something to pay attention to. And then navigating um, conversation without answers, right? Like mm. we talk about good and bad bias and there's just a moment where she's just it's like I, we don't have the answers for these things and that's okay we often try to have these conversations and you know with people and it's like i have the answer i have knowledge i know this but sometimes we don't and it's okay mm-hmm. and it's cool and it actually makes the conversation much more enjoyable so um dolly is amazing she is uh and you'll I, you know really hope you enjoy this conversation um as always enjoy the show because our brain relies on a lot of shortcuts that in any given moment, like you know, when the snap of my fingers just now, uh, one study says in that little snap of the fingers, my brain processed 11 million pieces of information outside of my awareness. Like, I mean, think of everything, even just visually around you that is processing right now without you like thinking about, oh, you know, what color is that? What what was happening there? Like it's doing a lot of work and only 40 pieces of information are being processed consciously. All right, today we are with award-winning, tenured professor at the New York University Stern School of Business. She studies the psychology of good people, or bounded ethicality. She teaches MBA courses in leadership, management, and negotiations. Dolly's first book, The Person You Mean to Be, How Good People Fight Bias, a HarperCollins book in uh, 2018, has received acclaim from 
the likes of Malcolm Gladwell, Adam Grant, Susan Cain, Daniel Pink, Billie Jean King, Carol Dweek, David Thomas, and Angela Duckworth. Just, you know, some small names. No, nobody big. Her research is regularly featured in numerous media outlets, including NPR, NBC News, Quartz, Goop, CNBC.com, Scientific America, Forbes, Washington Post, Cosmo Girl, The New York Times, The Economist, I have to breathe, The Huffington Post, Financial Times, The Stanford Social Innovation Review, almost missed that word, and you can check her out on uh, her TED Talk, one of the 25 most popular TED Talks of 2018. And that's just a little bit of the amazingness of Dolly Chug. Uh, we recently heard her on 10% Happier. That's uh, where we reached out. And we then read her book. And uh, we're, we're just so thrilled to have you on, Dolly. Oh, my God. This is really exciting for me. Thank you. And thank you for that lovely intro. Thanks for joining us. So, Dolly, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Keith. And I, I rack my brain often with the first question before we have a conversation and you've, you've been interviewed, you've been featured. How do we make it unique? (laughs) And so there's a part in your book that Rodney and I collectively disagree with you on. Okay. And so we figured let's start with a disagreement Mm -hmm. because it's fun to demonstrate disagreement. Yeah, it's good. So in your book, you mentioned you're a forks down person in the dishwasher. (laughs) I need, I need to understand the logic of forks down. I ran this by my mom earlier. Okay. Because she's and? watching my daughter. She's oh. a forks up person too. Yeah. Forks up need. But my stepdad is a forks down person. Don't know why, but I okay. need to understand this. Yeah. I feel this is a head versus heart <laughs> thing, guys. I feel like you're, you're taking a very head based, uh, you know, approach to what is really something that should come from the heart. It's just a heart. Yeah. Mm. There's also safety is, issues it, when you're putting it in. I, do mm-hmm. you want your children holding the handle or the the sharp part of the fork? Interesting. See, I this just a, I, see that's why I do knives down. I do knives ah, down. Fair. But yeah, the fork, yeah. I think I just got advice. It might have been my mother-in-law's. I think I got advice. I was like, put them up. And I was like, all right, I'll put them up. But now that you mentioned that, like, do I really want my children's grubby mitts touching the part mm. I eat off of first? Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah. And- so I have grates at the bottom of my silverware holder in the dishwasher, and the fork just goes right through them. It yes, sometimes and that happens to me, it- too. Yeah. Sometimes. Mm. And that's annoying. But, okay. And, and I don't know if they... Yeah, go ahead. Do you have a point of view on which part of the fork is going to get cleaner? The part that's up or the part that's down? Like, is that part of what... My point of view is that the... Yeah, that would be the theory. Because this goes to your... This is kind of a heart-based thing. Like, it feels like it would get cleaner if it was up. Uh, But I don't know if that's scientifically an accurate statement. Yeah, I do think we need a dishwasher designer... Involved in this conversation, if we're we going to go ahead, fluid, yeah. we need a fluid dynamic engineer to get in there and just break down. <laughs> but there, the there's all, and and we yeah. need a, we need a biologist or a physiologist or somebody to tell us what is actually dirtier. Is it the part our hands touch or the part our, our mouth touches? Oh, well, well it's would. it's kind of it's kind <laughs> not to to get too personal, but it's kind of like the toilet seat. Yeah, you know, yeah, you're. you're your butt is cleaner than your hands, <laughs> but we say. get worried about, uh, you know, yeah. because it's under pants all day long. Right. And, you know, so, so we, we get more worried about those germs than we do shaking someone's hand. Now, I'm That's not saying, me. you know, go shake someone's butt, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. And right. Then, so it's complicated. It's complicated. Welcome to and, more in common. <laughs> and, this is, and this is why I just rearranged the dishwasher without discussion. Hmm. Mm. Oh, you just go, do you just, you sneak in before it runs and you just stealthily change everything? I mean, if I was, if I was a little less lazy, I probably would. But the truth is my husband, I I always say my husband's uh, love language is doing dishes. He is just so always ahead of me on getting the dishes done. Um, And uh, I, in a way that I think just sort of. It, 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 every moment, every relationship has highs and lows, and and those like occasional lows, which are very occasional, 
I just look over at him doing the dishes and I'm like, oh, what is wrong with me? Like, come on. So yeah. I, 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 I think the rearranging is more hypothetical than really. I feel like that's a stealthy good tip, though, just rearranging without doing what I do and just asking everybody, like, why would you do it that way and criticize them? <laughs> Probably be better just to go just rearrange it. I, not I, I rearrange. I rearrange the re -rearrange? Out of my dishwasher. Really? Yeah. In fact, no one's allowed to put even my my wife puts dishes in the dishwasher and I I'm like, okay, that's enough. <laughs> You're not allowed to do that anymore. <laughs> so I, wanna, I don't know why. I this is fascinating <laughs> and I wanna jump in. Like I'm curious, you you do a lot of cool stuff. Um psychology is fascinating me these days for yeah. many, 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 many reasons. But bounded ethicality, like how did you what 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 was this whole thing that you're doing, like what got you into into this and and, and yeah, what got you into it? Yeah. Um I I have had really tremendous mentors. Um in my PhD program, my two primary mentors are both were and are both world famous scholars. One is Mazarin Banaji, who studies unconscious bias. She's a person who's uh, coined the term implicit bias. <laughs> and the other is Max Bazerman, who's known for uh, many areas of research, including his research on ethics. And what was interesting is that I was in a joint PhD program where I had two of everything. So I had one advisor in the business school, Max, and one advisor in the psychology department, Mazarin, and usually these worlds are pretty separate. Like they, you know, they don't really like talk to each other. Um, but I had two very collaborative mentors who respected each other's work. And we literally one day early in my doctoral program agreed to all three have coffee. And we were in Pete's coffee shop in Harvard Square and sitting there, this interesting conversation just bubbled up about Max, like I, I study when people do wrong things. And Mazarin was like, well, I study... When people <clears throat> don't know they're doing something wrong. And then it was like, oh, we all three should be talking. And so Bounded Ethicality emerged from that conversation, from both of their scholarship and then my ability to kind of, I think, help fuse some of their work. Um, and our, the actual term Bounded Ethicality is a... Uh, riff off of Bounded Rationality, which is an idea that won the Nobel Prize in the 1950s or 60s, Herb Simon won the Nobel Prize for his work on bounded rationality, uh, which was the, at the time, groundbreaking idea that the human mind has limited processing power and storage resources. So it relies on shortcuts to do some of its work. And some mm -hmm. of those shortcuts are t taking place like outside of our awareness, which is why you can do mm -hmm. a lot of things. You can drive home after a busy day pretty much on autopilot and walk in the door and not remember, did I have red lights? Did I have green lights? Like, I don't even remember that drive right drive home because I was just, my mind was so busy. Um, and so that's bounded rationality at work. Your mind's sort of <clears throat> handling what it can consciously and the rest of it's happening unconsciously. So our our insight with bounded ethicality is if that's true for your drive home and that's true when you buy cereal and all these other decisions that we view as more cognitive when it comes to decisions in your life that have to do with other people, that have impact on others, that have to do with, um, you know, whether you're you're uh, doing something honestly, it's the same brain doing the work. It's the exact same brain. Like, why would that brain somehow be, like, flawless in its decision-making? Why would I just, my ethical mm -hmm. decision-making just somehow take place without relying on shortcuts, shortcuts that sometimes lead to mistakes? So bounded rationality led to bounded ethicality and and a wonderful collaboration and for me wonderful mentorship from both max and mazarin that's awesome yeah i can think of times that's where awesome. i uh where i leave work and i'm supposed to be going somewhere other than home but i take yeah. the same route because it's like, <laughs> it's like it's <laughs> you like, forget no, yeah. yeah you're like what am i doing yeah. right yeah. yeah yeah i'm not i'm i'm now way farther away from that spot <laughs> exactly I'm now i'm even be, later than i especially thought it was living in la <laughs> And oh, I, do tend to be so late. I, I do tend to think I can get way more done than I actually can. So I've <laughs> already left 15 minutes late. And then, late. I know. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. No, I'm, I'm definitely. I hear that. you. I feel you on that. I love the origin story. I think that's fantastic. Now, what's Dolly's origin story? Like, oh. how did you ultimately end up at NYU with 
amazing mentors that are world famous and um what, yeah. what brought you there yeah so i uh i didn't even know what professors did other than teach you know i understood that professors stood in front of me and taught me and i thought that's all professors did and so i i it's not i'm gonna oh. tell you what they really do <laughs> what they really do um so my my early career years were on a path that was familiar to me from my family, from what the work my mother and father did, which was I went into a corporate environment. I worked in investment banking right out of college. I went and got an MBA. I worked in consulting. Um, I had never considered being a professor. I had never understood what professors did. And what happened was my family, fifth year MBA reunion, 1999, is, was when it took place. So um, you're both so youthful. I, I, mm. I, I Let me tell you about the 1900s. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I think we both look far more youthful than we are, but I love the way you put that. Yeah. I love it. Hey, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Um, as, as, as you might have heard, in 1999, the internet was, like, taking off, and there was, like, this whole, like, um, is it's going to be a thing, and like all the startups were taken off, and a lot of my business school classmates. So remember, we graduated in '94. We didn't even have email addresses during business school. '92 well, to '94, graduating '94 like without email addresses, and then by '99, the internet's like gone crazy. Um, and so what had happened for me during that time period was I was doing very well professionally. I was getting promoted, but I wasn't like, oh my. God, I love my job. I found my calling. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, my classmates were all off, like in the news, literally doing amazing internet things. Um, and while I didn't necessarily want to go do internet things, I sort of was feeling a little bit like, how come I haven't found like my calling or whatever? Um, and I go, I actually didn't want to go to my MBA reunion. I was feeling like it was just going to be a little bit too emotionally fragile to like, I don't know, you know, reunions, like you just, you really have to go in with the right frame of mind. And I was single <clears> and I didn't want to be, a, be a, single. A, I've never been in the right headspace to actually go to reunions. So really? I totally get it. Yeah. Meaning yeah. you've gone with the wrong headspace or you just haven't gone? Nope. Just ha decided not to go. Yeah, exactly. And that's yeah. where I was leaning yeah. that I was going to not go. And then somehow like somebody talked me into going and I went and the big epiphany for me at that reunion was when I was chatting with the other classmates that were doing the really sexy stuff. I, it was actually so fascinating and interesting. And I was finding myself actually, instead of being green with envy, which is what I expected, I was actually kind of like excited for them. It was kind of cool because I didn't want to trade places with them. I was like, that's cool. Not for me. Like, I'm not in the like high risk, high reward, whatever. Um, but the envy test did kick in when I attended some of the events they had for us hosted by faculty. And what the faculty did in those events was share with us what their latest research was. Now, this is the part of a professor's job that I didn't even really know existed. I had no visibility as an undergrad or an MBA that my professors were spending. I, I really thought they sat in their offices thinking about me. Like, I thought when they weren't teaching me, they were thinking about me. <laughs> and I thought that was, like, Typical how they spent their day. I why know. Is, why isn't Polly understanding <laughs> I know. Exactly. Yeah, really, I was everybody's thinking, just like, thinking about me, right? Exactly. All the time. And so. Um, all the time. All the time. So when they get up there and they're telling us about all this research, I was like, wait, this is part of their job? It's so interesting. They're studying interesting questions in the world. Their job is to try to unpack it and like challenge sort of layperson beliefs and get to the underlying truth and then write about it and talk, speak about it and disseminate it and, of course, teach it. And suddenly I had this epiphany a little late because uh, I guess I was, uh, I was 99, so I was 31 years old at that point. I was like, oh! <gasps> I should have been a professor. I should have gotten a PhD. I, sh I did this all wrong. Why am I in a corporate path? Why do I have an MBA? So I had that thought then. It was like sort of like having the thought of like, oh, I want to be Madonna. Like it seemed that mm -hmm. sort of unrealistic. Um, yeah. But you know how sometimes it happens that when you think of something or you, you notice something for the first time, then you suddenly start noticing it popping up 
all around you in, in ways that it probably like was always there. Isn't that one what of the it, biases? Like, uh, it's not recency. It's like, uh, there's, there, it's, isn't there a bias that explains that effect? That um, I don't remember. Do you remember, Keith? That would explain the reversing? There are a lot of biases. Which which bias? That which, explains, you, which? explains the effect of, like, I, I'm shopping for a Toyota Camry and I and then oh, I oh you're talking about me I thought you were talking about the yeah, switch yeah. oh, oh yeah, yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 like um yeah, yeah, yeah. you're talking about uh, availability bias I think like the idea that like yeah. something's more available to you in memory so yeah. that would explain that suddenly like I'm shopping for a Toyota Corolla I suddenly notice how many people are driving Toyota Notice yeah, yeah. everybody has a Toyota a Toyota Corolla. Yeah, no, you like I don't want one I thought it was unique right. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. so the, the the these things started becoming more noticeable to me about what a professor is and what they do, or people who I thought maybe I didn't know any professors, but it turned out I do. Oh, like my, my friend Lisa would be like, don't you remember Josh, my boyfriend Josh, who I, you know, I'm not with anymore, but don't you remember he was studying to be a professor? And I was like, oh my God, that's right. So let me go talk to Josh. And um what happened over the next couple of years was it went from being a fantasy to a little bit more of a, like, let's do some due diligence. This is actually a viable career path. And the more due diligence I did, the more viable it seemed. It's, it, it did seem uh, high risk to the, in the <clears> eyes <throat> of many people in my life thought it was nuts. I was like on the path, like a partner path and the firm I was working in and making a lot of money, frankly. And, and they were like, why would you walk away from that and literally start over, like b- go into basically a junior level, 22 year old type of position. Um, but it really became clear and clear to me that it was a great path for me. And so I, I did at the age of 30, um, I think I was 33 when I started my PhD, um, just start all over. Did you have to fight any, any, um, uh, did you have to fight family on that? I, I have a couple of friends. Uh, one of my, I think I'm a really good friend right now, uh, who's Indian, who left really high profile jobs at Google, Apple, or not at Google, Apple and Facebook to yeah. go work for a startup. And his family's like, are you uh, kidding me? I like, know, I know, I know. Well, I, I would say, I, I wouldn't say it was a fight, but it was many, many, many discussions. And I think I caused my parents quite a bit of stress on this. Um, they're super supportive, but, you know, I think like many immigrant families, my parents immigrated when I was a baby from India. Um, they've never had the luxury of kind of, you know, just going and trying something like doing what they wanted. Yeah. Doing what they wanted. Um, and you know, the truth is if I had gone and done the PhD program and after a year or two been like, oops, that was a bad call on my part. I'm out. It, I had the safety net that I could have sort of worked my way back into some other path. Mm-hmm. So um, I understand why they were. Um, and my father, you know, he uh, when he came from India, he had done his undergraduate studies as an engineer in India. And he came to America to get a master's in engineering at Berkeley. And he he had a thought of getting a Ph.D., and did not have a good advisor. So when you're getting a PhD, like I would say 80% of how well that's going to go for you, um, both in terms of your professional outcomes as well as your life outcomes, your health, your happiness, um, and even whether you finish, will depend on the quality of that advisor, your, your dissertation chair or your PhD advisor, as it's often known, and that person, whether they have your best interests at heart. Um, the person he would have been working with I, my understanding, I don't know all the details, but like, wasn't that person. And so the P, he saw, he looked around and saw the other people doing the PhDs and things were not going well for them. And so he had a real fear that basically I was going from a path where I was doing really well uh, to a path where I was just basically handing my professional and life outcomes to some random person and just saying like, I'm, I have no power. You get to decide everything. Um, and, and he's right. That is a real risk. And I, I can certainly also now share my own st- nightmare stories of peers who've had bad situations. In my case, Max and Mazarin, who I mentioned earlier, were dream advisors. They were just the opposite. They, they've, 
they've to this day I, I I just returned this morning from two days uh, at a conference in Philadelphia and Max was there and even yesterday I he was actively I mean you keep in mind I have I finished my PhD 18 years ago or uh, sorry I did the math wrong uh, 2006 13 years ago um, and even Yesterday, he was actively sort of looking for ways to support me and like talk me up, talk me up to so and so and stuff. So, uh, really cool. yeah. So, so I can understand why my parents had the the hesitations. I did have to sort of overrule them on it, um, and you know they've been super supportive ever since. And I think they finally <laughs> feel okay that that you know I, I was in good hands and everything worked out. This is something we talk. I, I'm interested to get your take because we talk about this a lot. Because this is very much the path that we're on right now, mid thirties. You know, what, what what is where does that passion come from, right? Yeah. Where does that spark to get us to do more with with uh, with intention and, and enjoyment? Yeah. And the, you know, we talk to a lot of people who are, kind of find that same thing, but it's hard to walk away. Like, and then you have the additional pressure of Maybe I don't know. I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm not disappointing your parents, or right. you know, you know, having to manage that. Like, how did you ultimately make that decision? Where did that come? Where does that come from for you? Yeah, um, I d- I share that for sure. Uh, I mean, I I have always felt with, in just my particular family situation, very blessed that while my parents have never still never uh, hold back their opinions in terms of what they think I should or shouldn't be doing. Uh, they're quite, they're quite generous with their opinions. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Nothing they... like unsolicited feedback. So, I know. But... I know. Uh, the kibitzer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> At the same time, I do feel like they've been very unconditional and they're willing to stand by whatever decisions I've made, whether they've agreed with them That's or awesome. not. And so, um, you know, and I know not everyone has that, so it, it's it's something I don't take for granted. Um, I think I was a little more sensitive or, or uh, sort of anxious about like what the rest of the world would think of me. Uh, you know, like was I? I was kind of going from an MBA world of like you know, kind of thinking I was something to this world that wasn't potentially perceived in the same way as high status. And so, you know, that, that did kind of, my ego was a little bit. Especially in the 90s. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, Well, and you you mentioned, you you also mentioned uh, it's too late, which obviously it wasn't, but still another thing to get over. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Like it's, now I look back and I'm like, 30, whatever age I said I was, 33. In 2001, I was 33. I, I'm like, 33? My God, I was like a baby. But You're at the baby, time, yeah. at the time, you know, it didn't yeah. feel that way. It felt like I should have already sort of figured everything out. Yeah, I know that feeling. Yeah. yeah. That's that's the feeling I have right now. Yeah. <laughs> and, you, and, you know, you also have it figured out already. Yeah. And you also have a family, which I think, you know, does add yeah. to that. I was single and had no children. Without so that, that gave me more freedom than I would have had otherwise. So when it comes to, well, actually, I'm kind of interested. Your so your family, your your family immigrated here. Your dad was an engineer. Yes. Um, or is an engineer. I don't think he stopped being an engineer. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, what about your mom? It is very much a personality, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, my mom uh, stayed at home with us when we were young, and then as um, she felt more comfortable. Like I think when I was in high school, she got a job. It's actually a great story. She decided she wanted to work. She had uh, been going to some classes. She had an undergraduate degree and a master's degree and in accounting, which she didn't love. But literally when we first immigrated to the U.S., we lived in small towns in Texas and someone she met told her, uh, you have to move a lot because your husband's an engineer and you move every year, which is what we were doing at the time. So you need to take classes in something where there's always jobs in every town. And um, I remember they told her two different options, and I forget what the other one was, but one of them was accounting. And so she she was like, mm-hmm. okay, I guess I'll go. Whatever accounting is, I'll go learn it. So fast forward, now we don't live in Texas anymore where I'm in high school, and um, she – 
reads an article in like our local newspaper about like a local bank manager or something. And it's just a nice article and an interview and kind of inspiring. And she writes a little note. She cuts, you know, this is back in the day where you would like cut out the clipping and like mail it to the person. So they have an extra copy for their scrapbook or whatever. And she wrote a nice note to her. And that woman called her and said, uh, would you please come meet with me and hired her on the spot? Wow. Yeah. So wow. she ended up working like in a bank and then in a, then she worked for the State Department of New Jersey as a bank examiner, which is the person who ensures the banks are following all the regulations, like looks into the books and makes sure when they, they're paying the right amount of interest to their their customers, that kind of thing. That's a really – it is a really cool story. I just kind of yeah. got like happy. Mm-hmm. I was just like – yeah. Oh. Yeah, that, mm-hmm. I, I wonder if that happens yeah. anymore. I hope it does. Yeah, I wonder. <laughs> I do think, like, I, I think, I think one of my weird, like, weird skills in my skill set is I, I'm not too shy, and I'm pretty good at cold calling people. And I, I think mm. that comes from a, having a mother that was always like, "Well, just write that person." You know, you read something, just write that person, or just mm-hmm. call that person, and like. Her demonstrating mm-hmm. that that is a that is a thing you can do. Uh, mm-hmm. Question: um, yeah. Small towns in Texas. What was that like? Yeah, um, until family. I was nine, that's yeah. where we lived, and we moved every year, so I was in a different school every year. Um, Midland, Texas, Wichita Falls, Texas. If you're a Friday Night Lights fan, which you might mm-hmm. be, given your football mm-hmm. fandom, mm-hmm. Um, that was one of those towns, Midland in Odessa, yep. Texas. Um, I. I, you know, I was little, so I don't have super clear memories, but I do know I was always the only Indian kid um, in my school, that we were typically the only Indian family in the town. Um, I didn't make friends easily. I was shy and awkward and, and read a lot and um, and kept switching schools, so didn't have continuity of friendships. So I remember feeling kind of isolated, um, but I had good teachers. I remember being like happy learning in school. There's a story my mom tells that um, I think I came home from the first day of kindergarten crying and she was like, well, what happened? You know, you were so excited to go to start school. And I said, because you told me the reason I should go to kindergarten and school is that I was going to learn how to read. We didn't learn how to read. It was like the first day of school. So I, I thought it was like a just add water type of thing. You've always so. had very low expectations. I get it. I get it. No, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know it took more than a half day of kindergarten. I thought it was a little easier. That's, <laughs> That's good. That's really good. How much, how much do you think that, they, I mean, you said you traveled a lot and, you know, the experience of, you know, generally being the, the only Indian family and you know, the only Indian student, how, the, how much did that contribute to your interest in examining bias today? Yeah. Like, did it? You know? I, it's funny because I, I don't know what, what kind of bias I did or didn't experience as a child. My, my parents have some stories though. Their stories are often about, <laughs> If it's the if bias is the right word for it, it was like them being so unique and sort of almost like uh, uh, some I don't know not tourism, but like like pe- people would kind of want to come meet them because they were like oh, oh like they were this. exotic they were exotic exactly yeah, they were yeah, exotic yeah. you know they're, they're that like positive just, bias if you will yeah, yeah like people would just like show up at the door kind of thing and there's actually this story about. Um, this, and also, people are just very friendly in Texas. These small towns sure. in Texas, people are just friendly. So, sh- like, yeah, showing up yeah, the door is not so sure. weird down there. Uh, but, like, there's a story of um, this uh, family coming over, and I was a baby, and they really took a you know liking to being able to hold a cute, cuddly baby. And um, the the mom the the mom who was visiting her son as the high school quarterback, which is a really big deal. My parents didn't understand that that was a really big deal, so she was sort of trying to explain it, and they were like, "Oh, you know, like trying to be polite, but not really understanding that what she was telling them." And then at one point, she said, "Okay, well, I'm just going to take little Dolly with me," and she like walked out of the house with me, and my parents were like, "Oh, okay," and. Apparently she drove off. Like she just like went, like took me. 
Wow. Yeah, and not and and of course my my parents were just like, oh, okay, is that is that what people do? Like that's kind of different. <laughs> and so so like she was gone for like an hour and apparently like took me around and like showed me to people and then brought me back. And my parents were just sitting there going, we really don't know what just happened. So yeah, so oh, there was goodness. there was like weird stuff. Wow. And they were like, she was huh. the nicest lady. She was always I mean, so nice. She just thought you were really cute. <laughs> Know what to say about so that? Much, <laughs> I don't even know. So I, so I was I'd like a, a little bit of a ask show, a follow up question. Right? I know. Right? What is it? Right? Yeah. It's just it's just show and tell, sort of gone kind of road. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Like and deep. Interesting. Like talk yeah. about bias. Right? Yeah. Talk yeah. About expressing, if not, uh, you know, outward, you know positive prejudice if you will right? right i think that's just it and to so to answer to answer your original question i i think i um felt on the outside a lot growing up um mm -hmm. not necessarily because i was being treated badly but i just didn't fit and i so it's always sort of made me i don't know i've just always felt a connection to anybody for whatever reason who's on the outside and so when it came i think that was just more of a lived experience and then when it came time to pick a scholarly topic i do think some of my immediate resonance with these topics came from a place mm -hmm. of like oh and of and of course i should i should say and watching myself in a million different ways throughout my life fall short of my own expectations in terms of how i treated others and and ways in which i inadvertently was othering other people or, or, you know, exotifying other people. Like, so, so all of that kind of lived experience. And this is where it's, ad, I think, advantageous to start a PhD at 33 is that you have a lot of lived experience that will inform your interests. It's interesting having yeah. that context on your childhood, because one of the experiences for me reading your book as often the token black kid in mm -hmm. growing up, was like and now and this is a looking back thing but i often felt a lot of like a lot of similar things not fitting in and yeah I, I think i just didn't recognize a lot of some of the negative bias that was happening or some of the straight racism that was happening um and but as i look back i start to recognize some of it um but i've had these feelings with me my whole life and reading your book put words to some of a lot of the feelings i had and some of the explanations I want to give people, but I'm just like, I don't even know how to explain this to you. Yes. And it was just, you put it so accurately or succinct. Like it was just so yeah. well done. And, and so it's interesting that you say you didn't feel it, but you, you just, you detail it and describe it really well. Well, thank you. And I'm so glad to know it's, it's been helpful to you in that way. Um, I do think vocabulary, like naming things is so powerful. Um, and I, too, like the way you just described what you just said, I just experienced something really powerful in listening to what you just said. I, I wish I remembered the exact words of how you said it. But you, what I heard you say was um, I didn't experience it as negative. But when I look back, I can see how it might have been. Um, you said it better than that. But I think that's true for me, too. So, like, for example, I would get teased sometimes, and one of the things kids would sometimes tease me for is they would say, I smelled. And I felt very ashamed at the time, and I never, I don't think I ever told my parents that they were saying that to me at school. Um, and I think I really thought through most of my childhood that I did smell, even though, like, I did all the hygiene. I, I only realized as an adult, when I looked back, I was like, I don't think I smelled. I don't think I smelled at all. I think I smelled like every other kid. And it was because of, um, it was more like you dirty Indian type mm -hmm. of thing. Um, but I didn't have insight into that. So I developed this sense of shame about my physical body and my looks and like all this smells and all this stuff that like took years to undo. So I wasn't characterizing that as negative at the time. I mean, I felt negative, but I wasn't thinking like it was bias driven. And now yeah. in hindsight, I'm like, I'm quite positive I didn't smell. Yeah. And it's weird. Like some of the same things like image, like how I look at myself now, how much of all of that stuff I internalized. 
and like my parents like very sim- very similarly my parents didn't know i i mm-hmm. did, i wasn't consciously aware of it so it's like i don't even know how i would have told them but exactly yeah. and some and again it comes back to the vocabulary like how do you even talk about it with especially if you're a little kid with an adult right it's, it's uh, um it's interesting listening to you both talk about this cuz one of the um one of the biggest things from the book for me was the description of headwinds and tailwinds Mm -hmm. as it relates to cultural headwinds and cultural tailwinds um, for people trying to move forward and just participate in society. And I, when you said, you know, when you were a kid, you felt like an outsider, so you connect with outsiders or people that, you know, may feel the same way. Because I've been doing a lot of exploring of things lately, Hmm. and this is something that has come up for me a lot is I felt like I didn't belong anywhere. So I have the tendency and it's when I was asked a question one time, why does this stuff matter to you so much? Right. Hmm. Because I mean, generally not affected by it. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's because I've always been able to relate to it in some way for some reason. And I think it's Hmm. because I've always felt like an outsider, but at the same time, my, headwinds getting through it have allowed me to ignore most of it and still just, you know, without having to, to, whereas, you know, some of the cultural tailwinds like that, that for both of you, I'm sure didn't make it easier to, to work through some of the similar issues. Um, so it's just, it's just something that clicked because, uh, and that's something that for me reading the book, it helps me explain it to other people who don't understand it. Like, Hey, Let's just let's just be very clear on what this looks like, but also it's like oh yeah your your comment about feeling like an outsider it, it definitely resonates. To, to give you some context, it. Dolly, Keith yep. in college, well, at least when he transferred to Purdue where we met, he oh. was that he was one of the white guys that hung out with all black guys. Oh, and, is that right? Yeah, and we, we didn't even bat an eye. Like he was just like he's super super like Ken doll. But like it didn't matter. Like he, he he fit in with the homies, and it was no thing. Um, uh. So all he's saying, like really, like I'm thinking about him. Like yeah, like he really did. It does resonate with it. Um, but That's maybe it would be interesting, Dolly, for you to like uh. break down headwinds and tailwinds. Like what what is that sure. even about? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and to be completely clear, this is the work of Debbie Irving that I'm sharing with you, and so I'm delighted to help get. Um, to take her language and just offer my spin on it. Um, so we think of headwinds and tailwinds as imagine you're, imagine I'm going to go for a jog. You know, I get, I get like eat my Wheaties. I head out the door. I'm jogging, jogging, jogging. And I'm like, you know what? I'm doing okay. This isn't as bad as I thought it would be. Um, I get to the, you know, the, my 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 jogs don't take that long. Okay, now it's time to turn around at the fire hydrant, my little milestone. I turn around at the fire hydrant, and suddenly I'm like, whoa, what's going on? Like, I can hardly move. Well, on the way to the fire hydrant, the wind was blowing in the same direction as me, so I had a tailwind, a tailwind that was sort of pushing me forward. And on the way back, I had a headwind that was literally blowing in my face, and the result of that is if I'm watching someone else running at the same time as me in the opposite direction. So let's say on the way to the fire hydrant, when I'm cruising and someone's on their way back, I'm looking at them and I'm like, they're kind of dragging. Like she, she's clearly about to slow stop. I can see that. Yeah. She's not quite as motivated as I am. You know, I can see that, that she's not working as hard as me. And I make all sorts of attributions because I can't see the wind. I can't, I almost can't even feel the wind when it's at my back. You feel wind when it's blowing in your face, but you don't really feel it when mm-hmm. it's pushing you forward. Um, the same is true on a bike it, mm-hmm. or or when you fly cross country to L.A. versus uh, New York, L.A., L.A., New York. You know, there, it's I forget which way, but it's like 45 minutes shorter, I think, coming from L.A. to New York. And so you don't feel or see those winds. All you see is the resulting behavior. And it looks like, Whatever patterns of behavior you see are to blame on the individual, not on the wind. 
So that metaphor that Debbie Irving crafted, I think is so useful in helping us understand outcomes in society and helping us understand when we look at, for example, uh, the the black-white achievement gap that's often described in, let's say, uh, academic grades, GPAs, SAT scores. We talk about this achievement gap as if everybody has the same wins blowing them in the same direction. But the reality is that's not true. There's tons of research that shows, for example, that um, the uh, number of books in your home, the education level attained by your parents, all these things are going to contribute systemically contribute to the ways in which you are able to perform in school. That doesn't mean there won't be exceptions. There's always somebody who can just blast through that headwind, right? But on average, it's going to have a certain effect. And when we just look at these achievement gap numbers and we say, well, I guess, you know, there's just not as motivated, you know, I guess they're not putting the time into their schoolwork. We're not seeing all the other forces at work. And so, Headwinds and tailwinds, it's it's um, really interesting to hear that that resonated because that is one of the things I've heard uh, most from readers. Like when I read the Amazon reviews or when I give talks and people share with me um, their reactions, that's that's a con- that's you know sort of in the top five things that people uh, find useful in building their own understanding of, of their own circumstances and the circumstances around them and in talking to other people. I think it would be, and I, when I was listening to both of you talk about it, I was kind of thinking like, yeah, I could use this to explain it. Like next time I have to explain to a white person why it's different mm. being black in America. And then I was like, nah, I'm just going to have him read Dolly's book. Like, and then we can talk. Like, <laughs> and then we can talk. And you mentioned this in the book, like kind of the yes. fatigue of like having to explain the difficulty. Uh-huh. Like, it, it's uh, like thinking about the fatigue is tiring. <laughs> like, exactly. Yes. But you also... And and also the like for me being part of the power dynamic, which mm-hmm. you also say scientifically demonstrate or is demonstrated that people receive it better from me if yep. uh, they're in my group. That's um, right. So it gives me a really simple way to explain it. And I love it. Now that's great. On that example, evolutionary impact of bias, right? I think one of the things that I think about a lot is. You know, we, we're in this time where it's very aware, right? We, we in the United States, especially economically, are, you know, richer than we've ever been in the history of humanity. You know, we all have food. We, well, not all of us, but, you know, we, we have the opportunity to think about these things. Um, yeah. But to, to truly see the change and, and see equality happen, is that a generational thing? And how much does evolution play into the existence of these biases? And at what point, like, do we forgive or reconcile the mistakes of our past so we can mm, move forward? I see what you're saying. That's great. I, and and thank you for offering that. I had not thought about this through an evolutionary lens at all. So that's fascinating. Um, so I'll I'll just I mean. And, So one thing, here's one thing we know. We know that the way our mind works, sort of your average human mind, that it is built to work off of shortcuts. And so that is not a, I mean, some people might think it's a design flaw, but I, I would say it's not a design flaw that bounded at the Cality conversation we had earlier is that's what allows us to sort of do a lot of things in a complicated world is because our brain relies on a lot of shortcuts that in any given moment, like, you know, when the snap of my fingers just now, uh, one study says in that little snap of the fingers, my brain processed 11 million pieces of information outside of my awareness. Like, I mean, think of everything even just visually around you that is processing right now without you like thinking about, mm-hmm. oh, you know, what color is that? What what was happening there? Like it's doing a lot of work. And only 40 pieces of information are being processed consciously that you're like actually thinking about, okay, what am I going to say next? Oh, does this tie to that? Is the mic working? The ratio. Yeah. 11 million 40, right? And so so (laughs) I think what it means, though, is that from an evolutionary standpoint, our brain got to be like this, you know, for certain survival oriented um, reasons. And that means that some of what's happening in that 11 million, some of the shortcuts that are doing that work are biases. Now, the content of those biases, 
so yes, there's a shortcut. If I say peanut butter, you say jelly. Jelly. Exactly. And you both did that without thinking. That came from your 11 million. You don't remember probably when you started associating peanut butter and jelly. That's just back there. Um, I don't actually mean physically back there. I, I don't know much about what where it's happening in your brain. I'm just it's just it's just a good metaphor. But um, so so peanut butter and jelly as a shortcut, the shortcut is part of how the brain is wired. But the content of associating peanut butter and jelly, like that's only because you grew up in a certain U.S. based culture. When I give talks to international audiences mm-hmm. and I say peanut butter. A lot of people just stare at me like, you know, when I did it, you might have heard this on the Dan Harris podcast, 10% Happier. I, I don't remember if he edited this mm-hmm. in, in or out, but I said peanut butter. He said smoothie. I mean, he's... He did. <laughs> he did. <laughs> he did. You know, he's really, really done a lot to sort of revolutionize his health habits. And so that's what came to his mind. Um, so the point is that is a learned association. It is not that did not evolve with us, and so so when we look at implicit bias, where implicit bias is is literally the unconscious associations between ideas, like between black people and crime, or between Latin people and illegal. These are unconscious associations. We don't know when they became associated with each other, um, and so that was not an evolved thing. That was the shortcut came. Th- sort of as our brain evolved over the millennia. But the content of that is stuff we learned from the world around us today. Now, what's in the world around us today, you know, has some connection to what was in the world around us yesterday and, you know, what our parents had and what we see as remnants of the institutions we're in, the pictures we see on the wall, that does Deep into Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum calls it the smog we're breathing in all the time. We don't even realize we're breathing in smog, but it's all the little images that add up to those associations. Peanut butter jelly, black people crime. That's that all became part of what we internalized. From um, looking at the group that we're with, uh, you mentioned, you know, if somebody mentions your ancestors in a negative light, it of, you know, you taking offense to it now or yes. umbrage. Uh, I immediately thought of, I, I actually thought of like the Me Too movement and my initial response when somebody brought it up to me and I was like, no. And 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 then I like broke that down and I was like, well, because I belong to the group of men. So like, I feel like an attack on men is an attack on me. Like I took yeah. it as a personal attack. Even yeah. though it's this group that I don't even like all of. Like, it's just, <laughs> we don't even agree on all things. So why would I take so much offense? I mean, that, but that's for me. Like, that's what I was doing. I don't, yeah. I don't know if you yeah. find any of that with ancestral stuff. No, that's really cool. You guys, thank you so much for helping me think about this. Like, both of these are points that I hadn't thought of. So, Rodney, what you're describing about, like, group identity, I mean, there's a whole, like, powerful field of research by social psychologists on group identity. And that's exactly what you just described. Um and I hadn't thought of that as like group, like, but historical group identity is sort of interesting that we would feel that connection even beyond the group I currently belong to. That my, it, yeah. So I don't, I, I think that's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, cause you kind of get into like white guilt and like white fragility mm-hmm. and some of those. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to use those cause we're in the U.S. and you think about slavery. And mm-hmm. like I talked to a couple of friends and they're like, you're really sensitive. Like I, like I have to, t- uh, approach it like super delicately to even talk yeah. about slavery and i'm like bro like i, I know, know you didn't have slaves like, i know <laughs> like we right, can talk right. about this <laughs> and then like some of like i have one really good friend like he gets really sensitive about that but then at the same time like you brought up confederate soldiers being like honored and statues and what yeah, he's like yeah. he's like aren't they technically traitors like they didn't even <laughs> want to be part of the u.s they were trying <laughs> right. to seed from the nation like why right, are we right, honoring right. traitors it's, right. like, it's interesting that he holds both thoughts yeah, which, which yeah, that's do. so fascinating. Which we can do. Yeah, exactly. And that's just something I I mean, it sounds like this is a provocative topic and and I'm that's that's just what I've been thinking about. Like is that the next area to sort of explore in terms of research and writing is how do we interact with our past and the past of the groups we identify with? So in answering my question, something popped into my head as you were talking about the, you know, you know, we associate black people crime, you know, white people safety, whatever it may be. This is actually something that we hear a lot as a 
justification for bias. And it ties in, I don't know if it, you know, it's, it's the idea of the, you know, amygdala, you know, fight, flight, freeze, fawn, flow, um, and our ability to just instantly perceive a threat. But then we think about the individual with a teardrop tattoo uh. walking on the other side of the street, right? Maybe he's black. And we say, you know what? He looks like a criminal because of his tattoo. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to play the safe side and not be near him just in case. Right. Right. Because I'm, right. I'm protecting myself. Right. Like, right. But at the same time, I'm still like, I don't want to have bias against people and I yeah. don't want to judge people. But I'm, you know, we, there's that almost internal justification. Like, how do, yeah. we, how do we get through that? Right. Because there's a, there, I don't know if you can call it a justified bias or not. It's, 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 it, is there such thing as a justified bias in that kind of case? Right. Yeah. What's exactly. Your take on that? Yeah. I mean, my take is I am, uh, trying to get better and better at noticing in that that in myself, you know? So, um, I, I have those moments all the time. Um, you know, I get like all worked up if I'm, I'm, I had an incident where I was supposed to be speaking somewhere and, you know, as one does when you show up early to, when you're speaking somewhere, you show up a little early to get set up and test the technology or whatever. And I, while I was setting up, um, somebody who was there to hear me speak arrived early and, Based on his interaction with me, it became clear that he assumed I was, like, the administrative assistant there to set up the room. Mm. And I got all worked up, you know, in my head. I didn't say anything, but I, I just, I got all worked up about it and everything. And then a week later, I was attending something, and I did the exact same thing. There was a, in, in this case, she wasn't the speaker, but it was, it was like she was a peer attending it. And I assumed this black woman was there to set up the room. And I was just like, oh my God, like it, it, so I am trying to get better exactly at what you said, Keith, at, in that moment where I, boy, does my brain go into overdrive to find the excuse for why I assume that, you know, like, well, she's not really dressed like she's, you know, like I, 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 my, the gym, right. the gymnastics my brain is willing to do to come up with a good explanation. That's the point at which I try to interrupt it. Um, just so I can see what's happening. I'd be like, Whatever. It doesn't matter what she's wearing. If a white person was wearing that, would I have not assumed they were here for the event? Like, I, I'm pretty sure I would have assumed they were yeah. there for the event. To, um, yes, I think there are good biases. Like, lying, bad. It's a good bias. Like, do with the tattoo on it. Like, <laughs> like do with tattoo on his eye isn't, isn't a genetic. Like, we didn't evolve to think that's bad. Right. Like, there are right. reasons why we think that's bad because typically that means they killed somebody. Like, right. there's a reason why that bias exists. Now, what you do right. with that bias is another thing altogether, in my opinion. Right. I think, um, I don't remember how you said it, Dolly. There's the, um, like, limited resources of the mind. Yeah, um, bounded rationality. I've heard somebody say that the human brain has no redundancies. So, like, the mm. same pathway that tells us that we're thirsty also tells us that we're hungry. So it's easy for us to confuse the two. Oh. You don't, like, so you, you, it takes some consciousness and some intent and in like breaking down like which is it like am i hungry am i thirsty or am i tired like which one right because, <laughs> because like there's a physical limit to the piping in our brain if you will so yeah. it, it yeah. reuses all of it for different things which is uh -huh. brilliant but for us it's confusing yeah and so like that's kind of where i think that this kind of breakdown ends up and that's where you have to be able to go in and like sit start to understand like well what what am i thinking and why am i thinking yeah it? and yeah. Yeah, I hear you. And and thank you for I, I, I should have been a little clearer. I am not saying all biases are bad. I'm I'm in fact saying the opposite. Biases are useful and it's good we have them. But I the title of my book is The Person You Mean to Be. So what I'm saying is the biases you don't want to have are the bad ones. I'm not even telling you which ones you should mm. or shouldn't have. You get to decide that. But what oh, I'm interested good. in is what's the gap between the person you mean to be and what actually happens. What if somebody doesn't think they have any? Um, so I don't know who to attribute this quote to, but I love it. The, 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 if you think you have no blind spots, that is your blind spot. Mm. 
So I, I think it's it's just not – it's literally not possible based on the social science and the deep evidence we have about how the human mind works that someone has no blind spots. <laughs> that will be my response if anybody – sorry. <laughs> it's just like when people I'm say I'm, all, I'm a really good multitasker. Like yeah. physically it's not possible for you right, to actually right, multitask. Right, right. But, uh, you know, hey, my wife says it to me all the time. I love her. You know, she'll yeah. leave me one of these days. I, but um, I've decided my response when people tell me I'm not as good a multitasker as I think I am based on all the research is, but I'm still better than you. There are levels. <laughs> oh, there you are probably levels. are. I will say. Yeah, there Some are levels people are for sure. terrible at it. Some people, are, right. Some people are barely able to swallow and breathe. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, you don't, yeah, be careful swallowing and breathing at the same time. It can time. be tricky. Um, uh, but, uh, so as it relates to the term bias, and I think yeah. this this is one of my favorite things that you're really focused on is this idea of being good-ish. Like bias has become a bad word, right? Like people think and hear bias, like, oh, I'm biased and I got to be careful, right? But do we? I mean, based on everything and all the research, like it's just a natural human condition. We have them. When you have one, notice it and, and correct it if you think it's a bad bias and Embrace it if you think it's a good bias and right. be a goodish person. Like, I, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. Well, what I mean, your take in on uh, bias being a bad term? Why? Well, I do think that some of our biases in some circumstances are super costly to others and even to ourselves. Sure. You know, I've I've written in the past about what I call the stereotype tax. You know, ways in which. Um, my biases about other people are meaning I'm not hiring the right people. Like I'm desperately looking for the right people, but I'm not mm -hmm. seeing who the right people are because of my own stereotypes of them. Um, you know, my husband tells a story about the first time he was going to buy sort of a, uh, I won't use brand names of cars, but it was sort of an expensive car. And he was very excited that he had sort of gotten to a, a stage in his life where something he, he loves, which is cars, he could go buy this really nice version of it. And um, he uh, was just very visibly ignored at the dealer and not taken seriously as a customer. And so he walked out and walked to their competing dealer, a different uh car manufacturer and has been a loyal customer of that brand now for the last, it's got to be 20 plus years. Um, and he's like, you know, if that guy just looked at me and decided I I couldn't afford the car, I could afford the car and I would have for the next 20 plus years bought that car. That's the stereotype tax at work. And then we certainly don't have to look too far in the world to see other examples in which um, we see uh, black boys being disciplined in schools far more than white boys for the exact same infractions. And that that when we talk about headwinds and tailwinds, those little biased moments that are split second moments, perhaps well intended, but leading to real differentiation adds up to a really serious headwind. And so I do think we need to care. I, I'm, it's, we don't, as scientists, have a lot of good news about how to de-bias people, but we do have a lot of good news about how to de-bias systems, how to de-bias processes, how to create checks and balances so biases don't go um, sort of run havoc. How do you avoid bias fatigue? So, you know, it, 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 uh, something I just kind of made up, but, oh, you know, the, the idea like that, you know, like constantly being aware, especially when bias <laughs> has a negative connotation to it, right? Yeah. Like just constantly being aware of bias. And it's, if I'm negatively connoting that bias is bad and I am aware of all of my biases, I'm ultimately going to create a circular argument that I'm bad and I'm never going to be good enough. Yeah. Like how do you prevent that? Yeah. That fatigue, right? Yeah. So I want to a say I, that resonates with me personally. I think I, 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 I didn't have a word for it back to Rodney, like reminding us of the power of language. Like, I think you've just put a name to something I didn't have a name for before bias fatigue. Um, so I have two responses. One, I think it's real and we should acknowledge that. Yeah, yeah, look, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I'm definitely going to quote you. Um, but the second thing is, I think this is where uh, I really have been pushing people to switch their mindset from being a good person to a goodish person, as you alluded to earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and the difference is that as a good person, every mistake I make means I am a bad person because I am in this mindset of I should already know how to do this. It's an either or I'm a good person or I'm not. 
Um, people shouldn't have to learn how to be good people. They should have just been born that way or raised that way. Versus being a goodish person is I'm a work in progress. Um, I know more now than I did yesterday and the year before, and I'm going to keep getting better. And so when I make a mistake, I'm not ha necessarily happy about it, particularly if it is costly to someone else. But it doesn't mean I'm going to completely sort of shut down my identity as a good person. I can still see myself as a goodish person. And to be clear, you know, some there have been a couple of instances where I have not been clear when I've described the difference. And I've heard other people describe the difference as settling for being a goodish person. That is not what I'm saying. It is not a lower standard. Mm -hmm. It is actually a higher standard. It is far more work to... Um, take ownership for mistakes and keep learning from them. But I think to your point about bias fatigue, I think it actually, I, I mean, I haven't tested this, but I think the bias fatigue would be less in the goodish mindset than the good mindset because a mistake is psychologically so costly in the good person mindset, whereas in the goodish person mindset, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, that's awful. Okay, now let me use it. I can use that. What am I going to learn from that? Um, so I don't do that again. And so I think the path to bias fatigue is letting go of being a good person. Because uh, if I use a sculptor, I was thinking, I saw a sculptor and a, and a sculpture and like a good person would be the sculpture. And then if it, something bad happens or proves that they're not necessarily the person they thought, then it breaks. It's done. And then, like, Ooh. but the good-ish person is a, f a work in progress. Like they're all like they're always being sculpted. They're always clay. They're not ever put in the kiln. Oh. They're always able to be moved and changed and made into something else. So you you, you don't allow yourself that damage. Rodney, it's a beautiful metaphor. I love that. Um, so Dolly, I have to you know due to time we gotta we gotta close it. But I'm sure we could probably talk for for days. Yes. Um, and so we always ask our guests if there was one thing you would leave. With our audience, what would that one thing be? Oh, if there's one thing I could leave with your audience, what would that thing be? I would leave with your audience that um, you don't expect to know how to use your new phone without experimenting and making mistakes and asking people and maybe talking to people in a younger generation, you expect that technology is changing all the time and you're going to need to keep updating and learning and growing with it to treat issues related to bias, diversity, inclusion, whatever buzzword you want to put on it the same way. It's okay to keep learning. It, the, 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 there's lots of resources out there and um, the, 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 there's none of us the, there's none of us who we are a complete sculpture yet we are quote Rodney um, always sort of being molded <laughs> <laughs>